So, delighted to be joined by Sally Ann Grassic, obviously top racing broadcaster, um, part of ITV Racing, and I think you're still part of uh, RTE Racing as well, aren't you, Sally? Yeah, things are a bit difficult with, with COVID at the moment, but uh, doing what I can when restrictions permit at the moment. Excellent. So, we're just going to have a chat today about uh, your role, um, how you got into racing, and a little talk, chat about um, what it's like to be a female in horse racing in 2021. Um, so if we could just start off, Sally Ann, by just could you give us a brief description of how you got into the sport of horse racing and more specifically what route you followed to get into the media side of the sport? So I was lucky enough, I was born into racing. I was <clears throat> born into a family. My grandfather was a jockey and then a trainer. Um, all of my dad's, the five boys in my dad's family all went into racing. The funny thing was in my dad's family, the five boys all work in racing the three girls have nothing to do with racing and in the next generation it's the the girls in my family are the ones in racing um started out riding ponies and then got into the flat racing side of it more um started riding out for a few trainers and the media side completely fell into i i originally wanted to be a trainer i went to france and worked for cricket head as pupil assistant when i was 17 and stay and worked for her for a few summers I worked for John Ox, James Fanshaw, um, some really good trainers. Uh, I was pupil assistant to John Dunlop as well. And um, all that taught me is that I didn't want to be a trainer. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work in racing, but I had worked out that I didn't want to be a trainer anymore. Um, and then worked behind the scenes with Channel 4, uh, literally getting paid pittance just to, to run around for them at Cheltenham and at some of the big meetings, uh, getting people for interviews and that sort of thing. I'd, I'd broken my um, arm riding and I was injured for a while and I'd, I'd done a few days working for race courses in Ireland and fell into it that way through connections, just met a few of the Channel 4 presenters, they brought me along. And then I hit a real barrier, couldn't get into TV, didn't have the experience, but nobody was willing to give me the experience um, to, to be on air. So I kind of not lost interest, but was trying to find a way into it and was struggling a little bit. It, it's, it's a lot different now with social media. It makes it a lot easier for people to create their own content and their own platform. Back then it was Channel 4, RTE. And, it, and that was quite hard to get into. So I ended up um, in France working. I was riding as an amateur jockey. And while I was there, the French racing channel asked me what I, Akidia asked me would I come on and cover international racing for them. They needed someone who, who knew about international racing and could speak English and French. So I spent seven years with them, nine years in total in France. And then decided to time was, it was time to come home. My family have a, have a stud farm in Kildare. I moved home uh, just five years ago, actually, this month and moved home without a job, moved home to, to help on the farm and to, to do RT freelance and to do a few other things. And then the ITV gig came up purely without knowing that um, that, that was going to happen. I moved home before that even happened. And luckily, the, the ITV job came up at, at just the right time. Yeah, sure did. And at any point throughout your route, not even just in the media, when you're working your talked about all that experience you have as a pupil assistant, waiting for all those trainers. Did you feel as though you were treated fairly or at any point did you feel as though you were held back because of your gender? There's always been negatives and positives to being a woman in racing. I, I kind of resent the term woman in racing because we're all trying to make it in racing. You know, we're all trying to, as, as one of my very good friends says, we're people in racing. And, and if there was a, a men in racing section, we'd all be a bit angry that we weren't allowed to join it. But um, th there's definitely been, been moments, especially I remember when I became pupil assistant to, to John Dunlop. You know, he was he was a great trainer, but he wasn't really ready. He'd never had a, a member of staff higher than a stable lad um, that was a woman. He'd never had anybody in any position of responsibility that was a woman at the time. And, and that there was definitely a kind of bit of pushback from even from the staff and that they just I was like 20 years of age, a 20 year old kind of coming in and trying to, you know, tell people what to do and, and have some sort of authority. I think that's difficult for any for any gender but um that definitely there was there was a little bit of difficulty but 
it, there's always a, a little bit of pushback in, in media, it's different again, but, and, and there's always a little bit of difficulty where, you know, people will say you're a girl, you're not strong enough to ride that horse, or when you'd ride in a race, you'd get a bit of grief from the guys, but I think you have to play up to your strengths. I remember, it's a good example, when I went to Cricket Heads, I was 17, 18 years of age, and I was trying to prove myself, and I remember getting really tough with a horse one day, you know, I had my whip with me, and I was really, like, trying to man up to it, and, Cricket Head pulled me aside and she said, you have to play to your strengths. She said, your strengths is that when you ride a filly, you sit quietly and you talk to her and you, you know, you relax her and you keep her calm. She said, play to that strength. She said, you're not one of the big tough lads who's going to bully a colt. So she said, play to your strength and let them play to theirs. And that's why we pick riders for individual horses. And that has kind of stuck to me in life in general, that we can't all be everything so you you kind of have to play to to your strength in, in whatever role absolutely and in terms of being on the race course has there ever been any instances where so you felt as though you, you haven't been taken seriously or when crowds were allowed in um before covid you know you've, you've been heckled from from spectators or people like that no, I, when I first started with, with the Channel 4, like back in those days, I remember being told no punter is going to take a 20-year-old girl seriously telling them what horse to put their money on. They said, you know, at that stage, the typical punter was an older man sitting at home and there was no way that he was going to think a 20-year-old girl knew more than him. And they did say that that was an issue. You know, the, the girls were we're more kind of expected to do the fluff pieces as we call them you know go out and and interview the the crowds or you know do that sort of thing or talk about the fashion we weren't expected to tip horses or be taken seriously and and I think that's true of of any you know young person coming into the industry it will be hard to be taken seriously and, and be taken that you know what you're talking about to a point but once you've proven your path and your name is out there it's, it's a little bit easier but I've never been heckled I've been called Briny Frost. I've been called Miss Mangan. I've been called many other female presenters. I, I got I got heckled because somebody said, oh, cheer up Miss Mangan. And I didn't reply. And he said, oh, isn't she really ignorant? And I said, well, it's not my name. No. I got called, I got told good luck Briny last year at Cheltenham. I think they know that they know my face, but yeah. they can't, um, they, they can't place which one of them I am. Um, no, I, I wouldn't say I've any had any negativity. Most people, on a race course are there to have a good time and they're you know they're, there's never really any negative vibes towards me yeah and you mentioned Bryony Foster um you must have seen the article in the Guardian in which there were allegations about bullying in the weighing room um that made me that that's the whole sort of force behind this article and which uh you're obviously contributing to is because it made me think uh you know we're in 2021 despite all the um progress we've made as a sport to come a long way uh, does sexism still exist um were you surprised when you read that article no i think sexism exists in in every industry you know we'd be cutting ourselves if we said it didn't exist in in racing it is way more open than it ever was you know i'm delighted to have seen rachel win the grand national and that's something that i i always wanted to see the day and i'm even happier that it's, it's such a talented jockey as rachel who won the grand national and not no, that nobody can say it was a fluke or a one-off or she, you know, she just happened to be in the right place at the right time. She's proven herself along the way. And um, the whole thing, you know, I don't know if I'd say it's bullying. There's always going to be, in an instant, racing is high pressure. It's split second decisions. You have to make them and you're dealing with people and horses' lives in that split second. You know, I've been there. You'll never know what it's like to be in the middle of a pack uh, you know of horses galloping at that speed and riding in in gallops in the morning doesn't prepare you for that until you're on the track and you realize how close everybody is to each other and and how you know one false step from one horse could could affect everybody else in, in the group so the tensions are always high and and afterwards things are kind of dealt with in, in the minute people react and they snap and you know we've all had spats where we've where we've you know reacted in that second but everybody kind of then moves on and gets on with it because the jockey's way room is a tight-knit community where people are you know they just move on because the next race they're going to have to do the same thing it's like if they win a big race they still have to put on their silks and go out to ride in the next race which they might fall in or anything could happen so what does tend to happen is 
people will pick on your weakness. So, you know, and that's whether you're a man or a woman, but in the heat of that second, people might react and they'll say the easiest thing that comes to mind. So if you're a girl, the easiest thing is to come to mind is that you're weak or you're not strong enough or it's because you were a girl. And I'm not, that's not necessarily sexism. It's just laziness on the part of the person you're having a, a, a disagreement with. So I would say, you know, it does exist to an extent and everything, but the, the bullying, I, and I can't speak for Bryony. I wasn't in, in her position. I don't know, you know, I don't know. I know from my experiences riding against men, I've never had any issue where I would have said I was bullied, you know, but it, it is a, a macho environment to an extent, especially riding out in the mornings and that, although there are a lot of women riding, it's still, it's still tough. You know, we're still taught that you bounce back up after a fall and you get right back on the horse. And, and they've had to kind of alter that because of people trying to ride while they were still injured in races. You know, I, I had a, a bad fall in France. I got kicked in the head and I bounced up and told the, the doctor that I was fine. And subsequently, I wasn't. I had a very serious concussion. But it's it's the mentality you turn up whether you're sick or you're injured. You turn up and you get on with it. And I think that to an extent, some people it, coming from different backgrounds, they might they might interpret that differently. And and we have to be aware of that of people looking from the outside that our industry is is under 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 the, the eyes of the public, and that people looking in from the outside might interpret it differently to to us that you know grown up and are are used to it. Yeah. And just finally, what a woman, Rachel Blackmore. I know, I know you're a massive fan of her. I've seen you um, quote tweet the tweet that you, uh, I think it was in Cheltenham this year or last year, saying, I want to be Rachel Blackmore. Well, what a, what a woman. Can you just sum up the impact that a female rider winning the Grand National has on the sport of horse racing? But I think the proof is I also put up a video this week of my friend's kids who were terrified on their ponies, had no confidence whatsoever, you know, this time last year. And they're galloping around, jumping fences, screaming, I want to be Rachel Blackmore. Like the amount of my friends who've put up videos saying, Rachel Blackmore, you have a lot to answer for. And, and I, another tweet that I, that I put out that I feel very strongly about is it's not just about her achievements on the track. I'm a huge fan of Rachel she's a great person um personally and a great jockey but it's not just about achieving great things on the track and having the eyes of the world looking at you it's also about how you behave and how you carry yourself and how you treat your fans and last year during lockdown through one of the initiatives that I run Thoroughbred Tales we had meet your racing heroes where kids could connect with racing while they weren't allowed to go to it and while it wasn't on and, you know, this little girl, Alva, wrote a, she did a drawing of Rachel on her horse and she wrote a letter to Rachel. And I texted it to Rachel and said, you know, if you if you could do something in reply, it would be great. And she sent a photo and a, and a letter where she wrote and invited her to the races when when they were allowed back going. And, you know, my friend's kid that was galloping around screaming, I want to be Rachel Blackmore. Well, Rachel did a video that night, no matter how many TV interviews she's done this week. She did an, a, an interview or she did a video that night to the kids telling them how, how impressed she was by their riding on their ponies and to keep it up and to come and see her at the races. And that's that's more than anything. You know, we talk about female role models and that we, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. But it's also about then how you your fans see you behave towards them and how, how much time she takes for people at the races when they were allowed to go racing. And then they see that that's, you know, it's not about egos. We often hear or something I always heard was, oh, they're too nice to be a champion jockey. They're too nice to be a good jockey. You know, we used to say it about Christophe Lemaire in France. They used to say it about Richard Johnson yeah. that, oh, they're just too nice, you know. But Rachel, Rachel is lovely. She's wonderful. But on the track, she shows that you don't have to be nice all the time and you don't have to be this ego-driven jockey all the time. You can have two separate personalities and in, in a way and what she's done for racing, we'll only know as the as time goes on because it'll take, you know, five, 10 years before all those little girls galloping around fields on ponies come out and say, hold on a sec, you know, it's not just the amateur jockeys, Nina Carberry and Katie Walsh and that. And it's not just the smaller, you know, girls who are doing it on the flat like Holly Doyle. It's, it's actually somebody, you know, who was just a, a normal person who ended up winning the, the Grand National and, and that, you know, being a jump jockey is a, a viable career for somebody. Absolutely. Well, I've really enjoyed that um, chat with you, Sally, and absolutely fascinating. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can keep making progress. Hopefully. <laughs>